Hi, I'm Scott Robinson, director of the REIT Center at the NYU SPS Shack Institute of Real Estate. I also have the privilege of serving as academic advisor to our student-managed REIT Securities Investment Fund. This fund allows students to invest in US-listed REITs, REOCs, and home builders, presenting them with an unparalleled insight into the challenges and rewards of investment management. Now that the fund has been up and running for a few quarters, we thought it'd be a good time to speak to other fund managers to learn more about their strategies, hear their thoughts about the evolution of the REIT sector, and discuss the current investment environment. We are fortunate enough to speak with three separate managers as part of the series we're calling Meet the Managers. They include David Auerbach of Hoya Capital Real Estate, Phil Bach and Ronnie Appel of Armada ETF Advisors, and Matthew Kirshner of Conan Sears. We appreciate their time and support and hope you enjoy these discussions. Well, great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we're joined with Matt Kirshner, a Portfolio Manager of U.S. Real Estate at Cohen & Steers, and Aaron Goldman, Head Analyst uh, for the Securities REIT Fund at NYU, and John Lawrence, President of that fund. Uh, I'm Scott Robinson, uh, Professor and Director of the REIT Center. Matt, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Um, so why don't we kind of run through the basic stuff? Um, love to hear about your professional background, uh, an overview of Cohen and Steers, your role there. Um, and then after that, we can kind of dig into um, a little bit of the evolution of the uh, REIT or real estate investment management ecosystem uh, over the past few decades. There's been a lot of changes over the years. Um, and maybe get in after that to uh, some of the exciting stuff, uh, talking about the evolution of real estate as a sector um, and how that um, kind of coincides with investment strategies and, and where the market might be going. Hmm. Great. That sounds good. Great. So I can start with a little bit about myself. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, portfolio manager at Cohen and Steers, I'll tell you a little bit about the company in a, in a minute. Um, you know, I've been here for 20 years now. I actually started as an associate in the uh, invested real estate group um, and um, over time became an analyst, covered lots of different companies. Um, you know, lots of different sectors, some of which I'm sure we'll talk about today, um, you know, uh, gained a lot of experience in, in that role and then eventually, uh, you know, ascended to the role of portfolio manager where now I work as, as part of the largest team on the street covering uh, listed real estate securities. So that runs the, uh, the full spectrum of, of kind of real estate asset classes out there. And, um, you know, my role as a portfolio manager is ultimately to make sure that, that our portfolios are positioned in the optimal way that we think will allow our clients to achieve their best uh, returns and, and do so in a, in a manner that's consistent with kind of their, their mandate, which is, um, you know, we are a long only strategy and, um, and we look to outperform by you know, at least a couple hundred basis points on an annual basis. And, and we do that by picking the right sectors and picking the right stocks. The team itself, um, as I mentioned, which is, which is really the, the critical part of everything is comprised of portfolio managers, analysts, and associates. It's a team of uh, about 11 people today. And, and um, you know, we're conducting research on all of the publicly traded real estate companies, uh, as well as some companies that I'd say have a real estate component to them, but may not be, uh, may not actually be uh, categorized as, as REITs. Um, and we are spending lots of time in the markets, understanding the actual properties themselves, understanding uh, what's happening in those markets from a supply and demand perspective, uh, understanding what's happening to rents and occupancies, quality of the different properties, um, and then of course spending a lot of time with the companies themselves, understanding who they are, what their business strategy is, what their capital plans are, how they manage their investment uh, outlook, but also how they manage their their balance sheet and how they intend to to grow and and what sort of risks they might be taking associated with that that kind of growth over time. Um, so we can get a little bit more into that. I'd say just let me give you a, a quick background on the firm itself. So like I said, with the, Cohen and Sears is sort of the founder of the 
the, the listed real estate industry. The firm started in 1986 um, with the first mutual fund that was really focused on the listed real estate space at the time. I'll talk a little bit about the evolution because it's obviously grown a lot since then. But today, you know, we have over 400 employees. Um, we manage over $80 billion of assets. We are a publicly listed company. We trade under the ticker, you know, CNS. Um, and more than half of those assets are in the um, U.S. listed real estate space. So it still remains kind of the dominant strategy for the firm. It's where we devote a considerable amount of our resources and, and, our, and our time. Um, so I think that might be a good enough intro on maybe myself and, and the firm. I'm happy to talk about maybe the, the industry itself. Um, if that, that makes sense. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, it's, um, I always stumble at the opening in my classes when I give my background, having entered in the, uh, the industry in the mid nineties, it's been a long time, but at the same time, the, the read industry still seems kind of fresh and, and evolving a lot. So, um, really impressive that you guys have been around since literally the beginning of, of the modern read era. Um, so uh, why don't we kind of explore a little bit the evolution of the, the REIT um, investment management ecosystem before we get into some of the evolution of the real estate and REIT space. Um, obviously, I, th I think you guys um, are, are really focused on, on mutual funds. And I think back in the day, you know, that mutual funds were, were kind of one of the, the very few limited number of products out there, but that, that universe of vehicles has really evolved a bit. Can you um, talk to our students a little bit about the difference between some of the open-ended and, and closed-ended vehicles and, and how they um, kind of impact an investor's ability to invest in the space? Yeah, sure. So there, there are lots of different flavors of investing. Um, there's obviously, there's sort of public investing, there's private investing, there's equity, and, and there's debt. Um, I would think of those as sort of the four quadrants. And then, um, you know, within that, public equity investing, as you mentioned, you know, there are actively managed, uh, you know, funds, there are passively managed funds. And that's a, obviously a big trend that I'll talk about in a second that, that has changed over the years. And then within the kind of actively managed space, there are lots of different flavors, primarily, um, as you mentioned, there are sort of open-end mutual funds um, or, you know, for us, we have lots of institutional clients who may not want to be in a mutual fund, so they have a separate account. Um, and, uh, and but I would say, generally speaking, those are run for the most part similarly in that um, in that the the money is uh, is invested and and the clients have their ability to you know have liquidity when they need it, um, and so they can put more money in when there are dislocations in the market. They can certainly take money out um, if they have other um, other needs for that that capital um, the closed end funds they the money is raised uh, in an IPO and, and can then be subsequently raised in additional equity offerings and, and essentially the money is um, is essentially there for a set period of time it used to be that um, it was actually permanent um, these days the new flavor of closed end funds is actually, that they have some finite life to them. And part of that has to do with how closed end funds tend to trade in the market in the sense that um, you know, sometimes they, they tend to trade at persistent discounts and having a finite life means that investors uh, you know, over the course of that period will eventually get um, NAV for that fund, um, whether that's 10 years out or 15 years out, but we have both. So we have both closed end funds and uh, open-end funds, we are entirely actively managed. Um, we do think the real estate space is one of those unique segments of the stock market where actually um, being actively managed has been and we think will continue to be um, an area that 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 active managers can, can, can outperform consistently. I think everyone knows the statistics about sort of the broader stock market. It's been a very limited amount of investors have been able to consistently outperform. That's not the case in, in real estate. Actually, most real estate managers have consistently been able to outperform um, the benchmarks. And, and thankfully, Conan Steers has, has been one of them, which has helped drive um, kind of our growth. 
Why is that? Um, good question. The, uh, the, the reasons for that are probably uh, many. One of them I would say is, is that listed real estate, even though it's greater than a trillion dollar market cap market today, um, is still considered to be a bit of a niche segment within the broader equity market. So I would say there are a handful of investors that, that dedicate themselves to that space. And then a lot of other people who I would say traffic in it occasionally and pay a little bit of attention to it. And so in some respects, it's the ideal world of it's big enough and liquid enough to invest in it, but it also is a bit niche. So you don't have, um, you, have you still have lots of inefficiencies in the market, um, which is great from an investor's perspective. So that's kind of number one. I'd say number two um, would really be, even though we're going to talk about the, the broader listed market in totality, um, it is comprised of, we would say, at least probably 20 different sectors that make up the listed real estate space. And so a lot of, you'll read a lot about commercial real estate, you'll hear people talk about commercial real estate, and the reality is it, can, it tends to get painted with a very broad brush, but the reality is under the hood, there's 20 different sectors, all with different kind of demand drivers, different fundamental outlooks. Um, and frankly, um, in order to outperform consistently, you have to understand the differences and the nuances between them. And you have to be an expert on all of them and understand that there are times when some might be doing really well at the same time that some might be really struggling. And so it's really, at the end of the day, capturing those, um, those nuances and those differences within the space that, that have allowed us and many managers um, you know, that are dedicated to the space to, to consistently outperform. That's, uh, that's, that's a great overview and really a great point about the um, increased number of, of sectors within the, the space. I was just talking with Aaron and John before this. There used to really just be, you know, four or five primary food groups, and that was that. Everything kind of changed and evolved, you know, we'll call it 15 years ago or so. I think they're going to want to dig into that further in a few minutes. Sure. Um, but Aaron was also telling me that, you know, I hate to say, phrase it this way, but his generation, they're they're a little more focused on, on costs. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the costs of these different vehicles and how that might sure. translate and how it could impact returns? Sure. Yeah, so so no question about it. That has been, you know, a change that has been happening over the last 10 to 20 years in the broader market and, and the real estate space has been has certainly not been immune to that. And so I, you know, costs have come down in the business over time. Um, you know, our average fee is around, call it, you know, in the 50 to 60 basis point range um, for our clients. Um that varies by by product, and but that does compare to um, you know passive ETFs or, or passive you know passive index funds that might be charging you know, I don't even know five ten basis points or something along those lines. So certainly our fees are a little bit higher, um, but of course the question always comes down to well what are you getting for that? And so that's why um, you know we've been able to build such a successful business is. If we can outperform an index fund by 2% or more uh, on a gross basis, obviously, when you net out the fees, we're still able to outperform um, what you would get from investing in, in an index fund and, um, and still allow our clients to you know, reap the benefits of that continued um, appreciation and, and, um, and, and performance. So, But at the end of the day, the passive universe is a major competitor. And so every day we are working very hard to achieve that goal of 2% or more or 200 basis points or more of our performance. Um, and we know if we don't do that for some reason, uh, that, that yeah, the money is gonna flow the other way. And, and so that does drive a lot of, uh, you know, what we do on a daily basis and, and um, certainly, you know, a consideration for, for investors. Yeah, you know, and the funny thing too was if I go back, you know, 20 plus years ago, it was it felt a lot easier to be an expert on real estate fundamentals. Maybe it's because there are only four or five food groups as opposed to 20. Uh, maybe because real estate wasn't in the S&P. 
didn't have its own GIC code back in the day. And so there was maybe less connectivity with the broader economy and, and broader market funds flows. Can you talk a little bit about data and, and data collection and data analytics? Because I know that's something that a lot of the, the passive guys have been focusing on. They have a, a rules-based investment strategy. And you know I guess that all makes a lot of sense when there's a lot of funds flows kind of doing the same thing. But it seems mm -hmm. hard to outperform if you're doing everything else that everybody else is doing. Well, uh, yeah, that's a that's a great point, and 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 the question is a, is definitely an important one. And and um, I would tell you, the data, the information has gotten a lot better, and obviously the access to that information has gotten better. So to your point, there's a lot more people that are basically looking at a lot of the same things, and so we're always talking about what can we do that gives us that competitive advantage that is different from everybody else? So, you know, I'd say it comes down to probably a couple of different things. Number one is we have, we have a big team. Okay. Um, and like I said, we're the, we're the biggest uh, team out there in the active listed space. Um, and we do think ultimately at the end of the day, real estate is a local business. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I can sit here, and opine about what's happening in San Francisco uh, or what's happening in Texas or Florida and different asset classes. But at the end of the day, we think that we get a lot better insights. And frankly, we that helps us drive better inputs and better um, views of the future when our, when our team is in the market, like I said, and meeting with the local uh, players in the market, both public and private, when we are touring the markets and meeting with um, the landlords and seeing yeah, what's the quality of the building, what's the traffic in the center, if it's a retail property, you know, do they have the right tenant mix and are they driving, you know, is, it, is are they driving the necessary traffic and sales and things along those lines. So, we, so number one, real estate's a local business and we think we can be more local and we can be out there more often and, you um, um, you know, and, and um, more targeted than anybody else. And so that's one area where we think um, we can you know, derive a competitive advantage. But another one, which I think you're, get, you're getting at, which has become much more important over the last 10 years is, you know, how can you access different kinds of data, right? And so alternative data has certainly become something that's um, grown in its importance in our process overall. And so we've, you, we use a lot of technology and this is something that we have multiple departments in our firm and, and, and multiple people dedicated to helping us basically, you know, find information that frankly is out there already. Okay. You know, there's all, you know, might be price, I'll give you an example, might be pricing data on rents in markets, right? Okay. Landlords will you know, because they know a lot of tenants are shopping around on the internet, they will post their pricing, okay, for their properties, for their vacant units on the web. But the question is, how can you find that data? How can you uh, essentially scrape that data? How can you put that data in a form that allows you to sort of, um, you know, develop a, a real good understanding of what's happening with those trends? And then how can you use that data to support your overall investment process. And obviously, so the process of hiring the people and this, developing the systems to find that data is expensive. So that certainly creates competitive advantage. And then of course, we think that we have, have a unique way of sort of getting that data and then distilling it down into something that's usable in our process. Um, and that is also a competitive advantage. And then we use that to complement the other parts of the process, like I said, the traveling, the understanding, the you know, digging into financial statements, and and um, you know, you know, making sure that we sort of um, have a view on kind of where things are. But then also, I would say the last one would be spending time with the teams and understanding where do they think things are going, right? Because at the end of the day, the markets are pretty efficient. They're pretty good about pricing um, things for where they are today. Okay, well, the opportunity comes in where, where your view is different in terms of where you think things are going in the future. Pricing that into your view of a stock or you know, a company and then 
having that difference in opinion and that difference in value drive your investment thesis overall. So, so you know, to give you some other, some maybe easy examples, um, back in 2016, um, things in retail started to change pretty dramatically, and people and you know things in the department store space started to change pretty dramatically. Um, but it was all sort of happening quietly. It was sort of happening under the hood. And obviously that was being driven by the growth of e-commerce and what Amazon was doing. And also just ultimately the market reached a tipping point where um, it, it changed how retailers had to think about their business and, and, and adapt. We started to sort of recognize that. We started to do a lot of work on that. And ultimately over, call it 12 to 18 months, we sort of came up with a view that the future of retail is going to look a lot different than the past. Um, and ultimately, it was it was doing the research and developing that conviction, and then ultimately thinking through what does that mean for occupancies, what does that mean for rents, what does that mean for cap rates, that ultimately allowed us to um, have a very different view of where we thought values were going in the real estate space for that product type, as an example, um, and allowed us to get ahead of the changes that were happening. And so it, it, it's, you know, that's ultimately where um, the, uh, the opportunity is in terms of uh, outperforming as an active investor. And maybe that sort of brings it, you know, sort of ties it all in, in terms of what I was saying. Um, that's how it sort of plays out in, in the real world. Um, but you got to have that conviction. You got to have that view. You got to have, um, and you got to have that, um, that, uh, that willingness to sort of be forward looking as opposed to being backward looking. Yeah, look, I think you're speaking directly to my my fund management students right now. Um, they've discovered how difficult it is to deploy capital, to think about harvesting capital and to not look backwards and, and make uh, have too much regret as they go through this process. So uh, I think that that's a perfect example. Maybe with that, I'll, I'll pass it off to John uh, and sure, Aaron yeah. to pose a few questions. So yeah, Matt, um, uh, I'm what go ahead, John. Aaron, you mind? So I'm I'm wondering a, a couple things. First, uh accessing data is difficult and and siphoning through it. Actually, I would say accessing is easy, siphoning is difficult, right? And for each asset class, you have 20. The approach differs. Sectors like timber or specialty or diversified might be a little bit more difficult to find information on and to interpret that information. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about those more obscure asset classes and how you go about defining uh, investment criteria mm -hmm. um, as well as going through that data? Yeah, so I'll give you, let me, let me, I'll make a few comments first. Number one, and this is for anybody that's looking to get into the in world of investing, um, there is an incredible amount of data. Like I said, there's more data today than there's, than there's ever been. But actually, the trick is understanding which data matters and which doesn't matter. And, and so it's, it's really when we talk about, um, you know, and then people say like, it's sort of understanding the, the, the signal from the noise, right? Deciphering those sort of two things. And there's lots been, that's been written about. And I think it's, it's perfect, right? You sort of, you got to understand what's noise, um, not focus on that. And you got to understand what, what really matters. So we always talk about what are the critical factors. Okay, so to your question, for the 20 different sectors, they all have different critical factors, as you call them, right? And frankly, we, we, we focus on like three, okay? I mean, it's, we don't focus on 20, okay? At the end of the day, there's like three things that ultimately really matter that are going to drive the performance of that company or that sector. Um, and we, we talk a lot about what are those. And then once we conclude on what those are, that's what we spend you know, most of our time on, right? And everything else it sort of has to relate to that, right? And if it doesn't relate to that, we generally would say it's just a lot of noise. And, and, and so we're not too, um, you know, we're not too focused on that. So that's kind of, um, that's sort of one thing that I would, that I would mention. So it's about what are the critical factors? And then it's about what are the, the how those can be different for the different property types. So timber, 
critical factors are going to be very different from data centers, right? Which are going to be very different from self stored. So they're all going to be they're all going to be different. So I would, as a as an exercise, I would encourage you to sort of step back and just say what matters for this property type. What are the critical factors, and make sure those are the kind of things that 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 ultimately you're focused on. And then the data that we're doing, it's really just how does it get us a better insight into what's happening, those critical factors. So for timber, as an example, since you mentioned it, not a big sector in our space, but it's an interesting one and it's certainly different. Um, you know, you'd say the housing market um, is a critical factor, right? And within the housing market, it's it's sort of, um, you know, it's it's sort of the new home construction market and it's sort of the repair and remodel market. Right, which is probably a little bit more driven by existing home sales. So certainly having a view on what's happening in the housing market, what drives the housing market, what that might look like over the next couple of years, right? That's going to be critical to understanding uh, timber. Whereas data centers, right, which are a hot sector these days, and certainly there's a lot going on there, it it's 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 something else, right? It's cloud computing, it's AI, right? And frankly, it's understanding, you know, what are the um, demand constraints and what are the supply constraints in that space today. So as you can see, so sort of very different things for very different um, sectors, but but it's all about pick a few, focus on those um, and um, and let that drive your sort of investment process. Great, thank you. Um, let me pass it over to Aaron. Thanks, John. Um, sticking with sector st selection, uh, in your prospectus, you guys talk about using NAV, cash flow multiples, dividend discount uh, method. Um, can you talk about how you use or how much weight you would give to macro data in that sector selection, deciding whether you're going to go over, under, or equal weight? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, I tell you, as sort of a philosophy, because we are um, you know, a long only rededicated re re group here. Um, we are we are experts in picking within the real estate sector, um, and we sort of try to make sure that the risks that we're taking in the portfolio are most focused on what I would call idiosyncratic risk within the real estate space, um, not so much focused on the broader macro economy. Okay, Me meaning we don't want our portfolio at the end of the day to be highly cyclical or highly defensive because we have a view on the macro because at the end of the day, that's not what our investors are paying us for, right? I mean, they're essentially paying us to, they want to make a real estate allocation. They think it's a great part of a broader diversified portfolio for a lot of different reasons. Um, and they want us to outperform the real estate component of their allocation. Now, that being said, understanding the macro economy is critical, right? To understand real estate at the end of the day is a reflection of the broader economy, right? That's why you've seen segments of the market grow to be so dramatic, right? Understand, data centers have grown because that segment of our economy, right? Has grown to be critical, right? The internet and, you know, <laughs> digitization and cloud computing and, and now AI and stuff like that, that has grown and that is, the sector has grown along with it. So understanding the macro is, is certainly important, but each sector has different sensitivities to the macro economy at the end of the day. So, so, so you, gotta, you sort of kind of have to have a view on the macro, but then you also have to understand how does the macro matter for different sectors? Um, that could be because of lease duration. It could be because of the cyclicality of the demand in those sectors, right? Like hotels, as an example, very macro sensitive sector, right? There, there are no lease, there, there's no lease duration, right? It's nightly leases. Um, it's, uh, it's driven by sort of corporate profits and overall GDP. Um, and, and, you know, so it tends to be more sensitive to that. And at the same time, it's a sort of high operating leverage business. Um, and so therefore the, de the de changes in demand will, will have much more of an impact on ultimately the EBITDA and the cash flow of the business, 
right? Because the essentially the margins are low, the operating leverage is high, and therefore, um, you know, so that makes hotels, as an example, the most cyclical of the sectors that we invest in. But then you have other ones that are not very macroeconomic, cell towers, which is the largest uh, sector within the real estate space, example, right? Long-term leases to high credit quality tenants. Um, and therefore, you know, what's happening in the economy matters to some degree because, you know, the discount rates matter and, and, um, and, and, and valuing those cash flows matters. But ultimately, it's, it's being driven by kind of data consumption, which we think is sort of a long-term positive secular trend. And ultimately, the economy matters a little bit for that, but not dramatically. So that would be on the other end of the spectrum. So you got to understand it, but then you ultimately got to understand how it sort of impacts different sectors and then different companies based on, you know, things like balance sheet and investment profile and things along those lines. Matt, Thank would you. you be able to elaborate a bit more about your investors and your investor base and maybe how various types of investors inform your strategy? Yeah. Um, so I would tell you we, we we have we have a lot of retail investors, right? Those retail investors will invest in our mutual funds or our closed end funds, and then we have a lot of institutional investors. So our our so a client base runs the gamut um, between retail and institutional. Um, I would tell you at the end of the day, um, that doesn't have a big impact in terms of how we're doing our job in terms of picking investments, I would say, because ultimately at the end of the day, they sort of sign up for a strategy. Okay, it could be an income oriented strategy, could be a total return oriented strategy, or it could be we've got new strategies that we like to call kind of next generation or completion portfolios, which is essentially they, they want to get exposure to certain parts of the listed real estate market, um, but they already have exposure to some of it. So they're using us to get exposure to the rest of it. They might have a large apartment portfolio in the private market, but they don't have access to data centers cell towers, single family homes, et cetera, in the public. And so they use us. So those are what we call kind of completion portfolios. And that's sort of a growing part of our business. But but that the mandate is sort of dictated either by what we have in terms of our suite of options, total return, income, global, US, et cetera, or some of these more customized completion portfolios. But ultimately at the end of the day, then it's within that strategy, we're doing the same things. We're, 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 the, the research is being conducted the same way. The team is the same team. Ultimately, it, th then it just comes down to what's appropriate for each different strategy. Um, we don't change the process or anything like that, but, but ultimately the, uh, when it comes to what goes into different portfolios, then it might be what's, what is appropriate for the different mandates. But, but, it, but we don't want the process, the research, the team to be any different because ultimately, you know, we're all one team. We all have the royal, same goals and objectives, and we're all trying to sort of work work together. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. I have a two part question, um, and I could be wrong with one of these uh, questions or statements. Um, for the mutual funds, they have realized gains and losses that they report. So I'm a little bit curious about how you factor that in with your turnover, how frequently the turnover happens within your funds. And if you think if it's possible to convert to an ETF, that would make it more tax efficient and possibly easier to scale AUM if that's on your radar for, for the Conan Steers business plan. Yes, so it is, and and I'd say you know, we're in the lab, so to speak, right now, trying to figure out, you know, um, different ETF strategies and which one makes the most sense. And there's transparent and non-transparent and things along those lines. So we certainly understand that um, that that if we can do what we're doing, but do it in a more tax efficient way, that there there certainly could be um, a market for that. So I do think you'll see more of that. You'll hear more of that. To come, so it's a great question. But at the end, of, we don't at the end of, we don't um, uh, market ourselves as 
sort of a tax advantage strategy of any sort. And, and frankly, given that real estate tends to have a bit more income than traditional, you tend to find most people invest in the REIT space in more of their retirement funds or in pension funds or things like that, that, that don't have to deal with those tax consequences. But, um, but, but I would say, yeah, it's, it's a consideration. It's, I'd say for us at this point, still more of a secondary consideration. Ultimately, we're still just trying to generate the outperformance and we don't want to um, take away from that by, by being too tax focused, but we do have some areas that are more than others and there's more to, to come on that. If you asked about our turnover, we're pretty active um, and we're very focused on that. Like I said before, you, you can imagine people scrutinize us to say, how are you different from the indices and, and why should I use you? And so we're certainly very focused on making sure that, that we're taking active uh, you know, bets within the portfolio. Our active share is high, our tracking error is high, things along those lines. Our turnover tends to be maybe between you know, around 50 to 70% or so, but we have some strategies that are probably on the lower end of that. And then we have some that are frankly even higher than that. So we're certainly, um, actively managing these these um, products. Hey, um, Matt, there's there's been um, a few people who've been very vocal that you know we've uh, very likely reached the end of the thirty year bull run in interest rates, um, probably two years ago, <laughs> um, and and that bull run in interest rates was one of a few drivers to the performance of private equity funds. Um, and if that's the case, if that bull runs over and we're in a higher forever, if not no longer, um, interest rate environment, do you anticipate seeing more uh, real estate migrate into the public markets? Or is there some other driver? Yeah. No, that's, or the other? that's, 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 I feel like you're, you're, you know, you're, you're certainly sort of speaking the same language that we've been telling a lot of people, which is um, the, the reality is that for the last 20 to 30 years, you know, debt capital has generally been widely available and, and has, has been uh, priced very attractively, um, certainly over the last 10 to 15 years. And that sort of, to your point, led to uh, obviously uh, appreciation in real estate overall, but, but things migrating more towards, if you're using more leverage, you're at a big advantage, right? The REITs tend to lever themselves just to give you, their, their leverage tends to be in like the mid 30%, range, call it, whereas most private equity funds are somewhere between, call it 50 to 80%, depending on their kind of risk tolerance. So I think that was a real big advantage historically, and I do think that that has changed uh, going forward. And so we do think that um, there is likely to be a lot more capital formation in the public markets, and we do think you're going to see a lot more, um, instead of privatizations, I'm sure there will be some um, along the ways when there's dislocations and there's certainly money in the private markets to make that happen. But I do think you're going to see a lot more money moving from private to, to public for that exact reason, because debt is frankly going to be harder to come by. We know that the banking sector is continuing to, to sort of struggle with the overall allocation and exposure to real estate. Of course, the cost is much higher kind of than it has been on the, but, but, but the REITs, the REITs primarily finance themselves in the um, unsecured bond market, right? So they're not really subject, subject to all the pressures that you're seeing in the broader banking sector. So their access to capital is much better than what we're seeing in the private space. The cost is materially better, 100 to 200 basis points better um, um, you know, today. And like I said, their leverage is lower. And so I think that puts them in a position over the next five years to really help recapitalize the private sector to some degree and take advantage of these opportunities. It's really what started the modern REIT era back in the early 90s, um, you know, after the RTC days, right? The sort of REIT market exploded um, to, because it was the only avenue to help recapitalize the private market. And I do think we're on the cusp of that. We're seeing some of that today with a few companies and a few sectors. Uh, but but my hope and my expectation is we'll be seeing a lot more of that, you know, over the next five years. Yep. Great. Well, I obviously agree with you. So let's hope so. Um, look, I appreciate your time today. Why don't we wind down on uh, a little bit of advice? I have probably 30 students per semester running through this fund. 
Um, and I think we all agree that the public markets are important and will probably be more important going forward. What type of advice would you give my students? Um, what skills, what if soft skills, hard skills that they should try to pick up here as they, they wind down their education and jump into the real world? Sure. Um, well, I think as it relates to hard skills, the reality is all of you are at NYU, which means you know, you're uh, extremely you know, capable and, and getting a great kind of education. And, and as a former um, as a as a former student at, at the NYU Business School, um, you know, I, I know that that's sort of preparing you uh, for whatever you want to do in the future. So I don't say the hard skills, I sort of would say, I think you should all feel really good that um, you're, you're getting the best you can get. I'd say on the soft side, I think that's where I think people underestimate the importance of that in the investment industry. And, and I think you sort of read a lot about this. If you read books on like behavioral economics and things along those lines, I think that's becoming really critical. It's something that I spend a lot of time on um, you know, in, in my role, which is sort of understanding um, how to not get caught up in the crowd and how to think differently. And so one of the, some of the things we talk about, number one, frankly, being open-minded um, is a huge part of what leads to success as an investor. Uh, you know, in, in, in my mind, um, I think a lot of people think, well, you got to have conviction. And that means that, you know, you got to not be you got to sort of like have your view. And the reality is we live in a very dynamic world, things change. And so you got to find that right balance between doing the work and having the conviction, but also being open-minded enough that you can change your mind if things change, right? And the world changes and the facts change. And, and so I do think being open-minded is extremely important. I, I think also just maintaining that sort of passion and curiosity it's really important. This can be a job, regardless of where you go, whether it's in the private space or the public space. So this can be a job that that can be grinding and it can be tough. And, and frankly, it challenges you in every way that, um, frankly, you can be challenged as, a, as an investor and as a person sometimes um, dealing with the public markets. But, but like, you know, you, you got to be willing to go that extra mile, dig a little bit deeper, um, you know, not be discouraged. And, and frankly, I think a lot of that comes from being passionate about what you're doing and, and um, you know, be, being, you know, intellectually curious to, to go that extra mile to find out those answers um, that might be, you know, not readily apparent out there. So maybe those are a few things I would, I would say um, there's a whole lot more, but, but I think, um, you know, those, those should go a long way to helping hopefully you all uh, that want to have a great career. Those are fantastic. I'm definitely going to share those around. Thank you. Um, again, Matt, thank you for your time today. This has been a great conversation. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate uh, appreciate you taking the time. Awesome. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks thank for you. your time. Okay. Take care.